You're listening to Later with Mo Kelly On Demand from KFI AM 640. And looky here, looky here. Even though Tawala Sharp hated the movie, Despicable Me 4 came in at number one again and had a very, very respectable $44 million or so. Even um, added 21 theaters. So even though Tawala didn't like the movie, the movie is doing well in theaters. Now, movie houses probably appreciate that, but as far as quality of the movie releases, not so much. Long Legs, you probably heard Mark Ronner explain how that was a surprising number two with 22.4 million. I still don't know what that movie's about. Don't know if I'll go to see it. Oh, you should see it. It's, it's good. It's, uh, it kind of starts you off in kind of silence of the lambs territory uh-huh. and, and then gets weirder. It's well worth seeing. And it was only projected to make uh, up to $15 million over the weekend. And it really blew that out. Um, inside out came in at number three with, uh, 19 million. It's haul is now up to 571 million domestically. That is another uh, bona fide hit. It is globally 1.34 billion. Number one movie of the year so far. Uh, very, very surprising. I don't think even Pixar expected that movie to do that well. Usually you have a, some level of diminishing return for a sequel. Oh, no, they expected this one to go gangbusters. 1.4 billion gangbusters? The, uh, early reports, they said that this was going to be the first billion dollar film of the year. Well, it was true to form in that regard. I have a, a quick question. Um, I had the opportunity to see a screening of the new movie Twisters. Which Did is, you? Yeah, which is not... It's not a sequel per se to the 1996 movie Twister with Helen Hunt and Bill Paxton, but it is, they say, a continuation of the overarching story. It, it's, hmm. it's a succession of that story, but it's not connected in any way. There are no characters shared. There are no updates on anyone. There are some homages in it. I saw it. It was okay. It stars Glenn Powell and someone else I never heard of. Can't remember her name, but you know it, it was okay. It, there was some decent CGI and some tense moments. I did appreciate how they made the movie as if the the tornadoes plural were definitely monstrous, villainous. They were characters in the movie. I just didn't buy the story. If you saw the original, you know Helen Hunt is scarred by the loss in memory of her, her father. So she's doing this in memory of him to get more information about how and why tornadoes form this movie. The protagonist, she's scarred because she lost friends while in college studying tornadoes, trying to get more information about how and why they form. And the whole movie is about her trying to get more information. Say it with me, how and why tornadoes form. It seems like everything that Helen Hunt and Bill Paxton did in 1996 meant Nothing. I was about to say, they learned I thought they, nothing. I thought the the whole point of the device that they created, solved Dorothy, it. Dorothy, yeah. one, two, and three. Yeah, it didn't. It didn't because clearly what they're working with now with this updated technology, they didn't know much more. Oh. I, I don't know what to say. It, it's almost like the first movie didn't happen at all in the larger telling of the Twisters universe. But there is supposed to be, you know, this is. This is a Twisters universe. This happens within the same world. You know, they even have the homage. It's not a big secret. It's in the trailer. An homage to the red truck. They have almost an identical red truck. It's just old and beat up now. That's the main truck in this movie. Okay. Yeah, it, it was okay. I just threw that in there because um, I'm trying to figure out when it comes out. I think out. it comes out tomorrow. I think it comes out tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a lot of anticipation for that. I loved Twister, the original. So... It was tr- it was sledding uphill for me. Glenn Powell is a fine actor. It's just that the movie itself, they should have called it, I don't know, Tornadoes or something like that. It's just, don't call it something else. Don't try to connect it. They had the same even font as the original movie. So they're trying to let you know it's a continuation of the storyline. But it's not a continuation of the storyline. 
Boy, look at the perks you get. <laughs> An advanced screening of the Twister movie. You, you no, know, wait, you're you on the A-list? No, no, no. no. Boy. You don't know. Twall and I, we used to go to a lot of screenings. Uh-huh. A lot. Because we had more time. Now, if you're doing a show between 7 and 10, Monday through Friday... Look, I get not a lot I get good. invites to screenings from Amazon right. and movie, but they're all Netflix starting always. at six o'clock, <laughs> starting at seven yes. o'clock, and I'm like, no, can't go. So that will probably be number one this week, this coming week. But let me get back to the chart. Coming in at number four this week is A Quiet Place. Day one, it's still hanging tough, has a total of 115 million domestically. And 220 million worldwide. But see, this is another example of diminishing returns. I think that's the lowest of the three movies. Total yeah. gross, if I'm not mistaken. Um, number five, Fly Me to the Moon. I think that underperformed. It came in with nine million, and this is a debut week. That's domestic, and it had nine million international, so 18 million worldwide. I didn't really care. I didn't want to see that movie because I've seen the movie Capricorn 1. So at best, it's a pale imitation of Capricorn 1 if you know the storyline. Oh, you can't beat Capricorn 1. Uh, Capricorn 1 with better special effects could have been a classic movie. I think it is a classic movie regardless of the presence of Oh, I think it's a cult classic. I think it's a cult classic. It could have been a straight-up classic if it had today's production sensibilities available to it well yeah and you and i were talking about outland a couple breaks ago same director peter hyams he cranked out some wonderfully entertaining stuff for a couple decades uh around the 80s and uh, 70s bad boys ride or die at number six coming in number seven um is horizon american saga chapter one coming coming in number eight is maxine triple x Number nine, Sound of Hope, the story of Possum Trot. And I'm hearing like a lot of good reviews on that. Mm. that well, I'm not going to see it. I said they think called Possum <laughs> Trot. Well, would you rather see Indian 2, which came in at number 10 with 1.2 like million? That. I, that's I what I'm saying. Like, I have no idea what it like is. What's happening? It came in at number 10. I don't like that. And did you know they re released The Lion King? Yeah. They brought in a million dollars this week. Yeah. That's just cheap. That's just a cheap ploy. That's just like free money. It's like, let's just throw it back in theaters. It's summertime. Yeah. Somebody will go see it. Now, see, the Horizon movie, that did so bad that they've canceled Horizon 2. Well, they didn't cancel it. They postponed it. Um, I thought they weren't going to. I thought they postponed it damn near indefinitely. No, I thought that they weren't going to try to release the next one in theaters. It was supposed to go direct to streaming. Well, the last that I read was that they they wanted to give this first one more of a chance to be seen by people. And so they pushed off the, the second one. They want people to see this on on streaming on I, Max on. I won't. <laughs> I really I won't. want to see it, uh, and I feel bad that I didn't go uh, and see it in the theater. But now that I know it's going to be hitting streaming soon, I'm not going to. It's hard for me to watch long, dull movies. It was. It took me like three different sittings to watch Dune Part Two. I still haven't bothered because I, the first one was such a snoozer. It's kind of like the second part of that. Uh, Zack Snyder uh, abomination that's on Netflix. Why would I put myself through a part two oh, if the first one sucks? I'm so telling bad? you, part two, I don't care what Tawala says, he's wrong. It's worse than part one. And that took me like five sittings. No exaggeration. Yeah, life is short. Every hour counts. Why, I, I couldn't does, get through it. It was yeah. so bad. Yeah, It was streaming bad. Your Horizon movie, they say it's pulled from theaters, so it's not coming out August, and at this time, the film remains uh, unclear when it will ever come out. Well, that's too bad. I love westerns, and uh, I'm kind of I'm ambivalent about Costner, but I think he knows how to make a decent movie. Okay. Yeah, I think he does. It's just that me personally, I don't like long, slow, plotting movies. Not not any of the uh, Lord of the Rings movies. None of them. I just there's a lot of walking and talking. I don't need three hours of that. Uh, that's honestly part of what's kept me from seeing it in the theater because you got to spend like a half a day just to see this movie. And as we get older, I get crankier and crankier about movies that are over two hours. Like you, you couldn't do this in two hours or 90 minutes. Really? Well, well not only that, I got to go to the bathroom. You know, I, it's three hours. Uh, yeah, I'm I gonna, forgot to mention your prostate. I'm sorry. Thank you. Yes. At least I care about my prostate, even if you don't. No, we all do. Thank you. No, that wasn't funny. <laughs> it wasn't a joke. It's a statement of fact. 
I'm going to start <laughs> making Moe's prostate a regular feature of, uh, of my weekly reviews. No, no, no. It was making an appearance. It's not going to stay. It's not going to be a regular feature. Well, it'll be subtext in all of them, whether or not you pick up on it. It's later with Mo Kelly. We're going to talk about Atari Summer Camp when we come back. KFI AM 640 Live everywhere in the iHeartRadio app. You're listening to Later with Mo Kelly on demand from KFI AM 640. Atari. We all know it's one of the world's most iconic consumer brands and interactive entertainment producers in the world. They announced earlier that there is open enrollment for Atari Summer Camp, which is an eight-week online celebration of retro gaming and everything 1980s. And that's just perfect for someone who's Gen X like me. And anyone can join during the camp season by signing up at Atari. Dot com. And I have to ask this question, Elmer, you were born in the late 20th century. 92. Do, do you have any memory of an Atari console? I never owned one, but like I know of them. <laughs> Mark, he knows of them. He's never laid his hand on an Atari console. <sighs> wow. <sighs> there are partner events and virtual field trips which will be announced over the course of the four two-week sessions. They also include special activations, uh, Coinbase, Nifty Island, Roller Coaster Tycoon, and more. Participants will log into a personalized Atari Club page and gain access to a camp portal modeled after an Atari ST desktop that is hosted by an AI camp director, old meeting new. Programming will take place in Discord, social media, and several immersive partner platforms. If you're on the net, you know what all that means. There's going to be a mix of virtual and IRL in real-life activities. will be revealed over the eight-week camp, including high-score competitions, scavenger hunts, creative projects, trivia, and special apparel and accessory drops. Let me just ask you this. Can you really call it a summer camp if it's eight weeks long? That sounds like a semester. That sounds like a chore. I don't want to do anything for eight weeks. Yeah, you're not a gamer, though. That's true. That's true. I'm, I haven't been a gamer since I played an Atari. I never had an Atari, but I played Atari with my friend across the street. I had an, a television. Yeah, Elmer's making me feel ancient here. I actually had in my swinging bachelor pad in Seattle a Donkey Kong uh, cocktail <laughs> machine. <laughs> nice. Nice. Can't go wrong. Uh, no, I feel like 200 years old now, though. Well, it was but, only like 50 years ago. So, yeah, yeah, you know, that was fresh for all of us. But my son would have been into this. Like when he was younger, he would have mm-hmm. probably wanted to attend something rather than going to an actual camp. Yeah. As much as he's into gaming, he would have loved something like this. And as you know, this, uh, the Atari summer camp is inspired by the Atari operated computer camps from aspiring programmers. That ran in the 1980s. The camps blended a comprehensive computer education and programming curriculum with a more traditional camp experience, including social activities, sports, swimming, music, and art. So it's not just programming and playing games. There's a, there's a degree of physicality with it. Uh, there's a full, uh, the Atari Club is an expression of Atari's history. Uh, it's present and its future is a nexus for connecting with fans and partners and together exploring Atari and collaborating on future projects. And here's another example. We talked about this before. Usually the company which has the first success doesn't have the lasting success. When you think about a home gaming console, Atari was it. It was the first one. And it was huge, and then it disappeared. Don't forget Pong. Well, but that was a game. But I'm talking about a console where you had cartridges and and cassettes in a way that changed the way that we had. We left the physical arcade and could play versions of arcade games at home. Oh, my God. It was like we were living in the future. Are you kidding? It it was the best of times and the best of times. There was (laughs) no downside to it at all, even though the graphics were prehistoric. They were two-dimensional uh, basic blocks and bricks, but it made the most out of it. Also, Donkey Kong was really hard. Pac-Man, I found you could get some expertise and, and make a quarter go for a while. Oh, no, yeah. But, I mean, the stand-up vertical arcade games, there was no replacing them. But you still could have that fun playing games and versions of them at home. Like, you had a Missile Command in the arcade, and you had a Missile Command on Atari. Oh, those are also hard. Missile Command would give you a breakdown. Well, I hated some of those games because no matter what, you were going to lose. It was just a matter of time. Yeah. 
you you always be it asteroids, whatever, you were gonna lose. You're only gonna get but so high, Galaga, you were gonna lose. That was my frustrating. There was like you never got to a boss level where you won the game. But yeah, see, the twenty six hundred did that though. The twenty six hundred when when it started getting more and more advanced, that is what what kept us out of the arcade is when the game stepped up and the graphics started looking good. That is when it was next level. Well, that was the Atari 5200. The the 5200. Yes. Yes. That, that's when it was like, okay, pitfall and right. You know, dig, dug, all those dragons and dragons, like stuff like that was like, that's next level for us. Dig Dug, also pretty hard. In fact, <laughs> I'll, I'll admit this as a fully grown adult. I, I went on a Dig Dug thing like last year and I wouldn't quit until I reached a certain score. That game is not easy. But no, Cubert. I uh, hated Cubert. Yeah, Cubert's tough too. And, and irritating. I liked <laughs> Defender, especially on Atari. Oh, tell And me, in, in the arcade and also Zaxxon. Oh, Zaxxon. You may not remember Zaxxon. You played that? It was like a three-dimensional game where you're trying to f- fly almost like through these Tetris-type openings. It was yes. really hard. Uh, but there was a, a reasonable version of it on Atari. And, yeah, it was great. It was great back then. Uh, there's no way that kids today would look at that. It's like you, you, you actually spent time playing this because it was ridiculously prehistoric. But, yeah. It, it, and it's weird because for as much as I played computer games back then – I don't have any desire to do them now. My computer games are other things now. I like doing other things with my time. I feel like I'm wasting time just playing games. I have no games on my phone. Zero. I just don't play games. Now, I don't mind, like, stat games that are kind of running in the background, like fantasy football, those types of things. I don't have to devote a lot of time, and it can just kind of do its own thing. But to sit there and be a captive audience to a game for three or four hours at a time no can't do it well that's what happens i'll get wrapped up in a game and i'll lose a couple days four days days and, yes and at the end of that i'll think what do i retain of this what what is this worth it's not like reading a great book or or seeing a couple great movies it's just kind of done when it's done right and i never developed that gene in adulthood like i never got into the whole xbox Sony PlayStation, none of that. And the games are tremendous. They are wowzers as far as the capabilities and functionality. And I could admire them, but I have no desire to play them. None. Well, I still play those first and third person shooters, but at a certain point, they're all the same. Uh, see, and I never got into the shooters. Never. I like the games like Wizardry, the role playing games. You'd have attributes and you could put together teams of people. But that was it. Those are the games that appealed to me. And that grew out of the, I would say, the beginning computer revolution and BBS bulletin board systems, not the cartridge games of the of, of the Atari years. So you don't have a console at home? I had, I had in television. No, but now you don't. No. Not Wait, at all. Mark, you're a gamer now? You game currently, right now? Uh, not as much as I used to. I only have a PS4. I don't have a 5. There you go. There it is. Wow. I only have a four, not a five. I don't have the latest console. I don't have a P nothing. <laughs> right. I don't have the time for a PS anything. <laughs> PS prostate for you. <laughs> right. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> Call back. <laughs> okay. If you okay. if you open your mouth any wider when you do that, your teeth are gonna fall right out. Come on, Elmer. No. So then you can't be goaded into a rim shot. What the hell is wrong with you? Don't He's supposed him, to earn it. Don't let him scold you like that. He's not your boss. <laughs> this is later with Mo Kelly. KFI AM640. We're live everywhere on the iHeartRadio app. And we have a NASA update. They're investing in a rocket that could get humans to Mars and back in two months. Two months. Be home in time for dinner. You're listening to Later with Mo Kelly on demand from KFI AM640. Growing up as a kid, I loved space exploration, the idea of it. I was a space shuttle kid. I was too young to remember the Apollo missions. I got to see all of the space shuttle missions, the development of the space shuttle. But we didn't go anywhere. We didn't go to the moon. We didn't go to Mars. We didn't go anywhere cool. We just kind of launched, you know, rotated the Earth a few times. And then we came back and landed. I wanted us to explore explore farther out into the reaches of space space but the 
But the difficulty was that we did not technologically have the propulsion available to do it. To get to Mars would mean an extended trip in which astronauts would be exposed to ungodly amounts of radiation. And it probably would be a one-way trip. It would take too long to get to Mars and unlikely that they would be able to get astronauts back. So up until now, it's been a fool's errand in that regard. More imagination than anything. And if we could ever develop the propulsion side and get astronauts to and from Mars quicker, then Mars becomes more of a likely destination. Now there is the pulsed plasma rocket, which in theory could propel a ship up to 100,000 miles per hour. NASA has invested $725,000, which is a paltry sum, but they've, they've invested about three quarters of a million dollars in a new rocket system that if it does as advertised could solve one of the major obstacles in regard to sending humans to Mars, just trying to shorten the travel time. Currently, a round trip to Mars would take almost two years, a year there and a year back. All that radiation exposure in between, there's not enough shielding. All that radiation in between most likely would kill you just on the way there. There's solar radiation, there's cosmic radiation, There's the harmful effects of zero gravity, the isolation being in that small tube or whatever it is for a year each way. And then there's just the, I'll say the harsh elements of the Mars atmosphere. It's least likely, it's very unlikely that astronauts would survive the journey, much less survive Mars. Because space radiation is the biggest threat. Astronauts who spend just six months in space, I'm saying In space, low orbit, not actually traveling anywhere, just low orbit. They are exposed to roughly the same amount of radiation as 1,000 chest x-rays. 1,000 just sitting up on the space station. It's almost like if you go to the International Space Station and spend a good six months there, you have more than quadrupled your risk for cancer or nervous system damage, bone loss, heart disease. And that's just a short list of staying in space. Because when you're in space, you don't have the benefit of the protection of our atmosphere, which usually blocks out most of the cosmic and space radiation. In space, you're just out there and you're just uh, just sucking it all in. But if you get to Mars quicker, less time, there's less exposure to that radiation instead of the two-year journey. Uh, but about this new technology, it would be another 20 years before this technology could be fully developed, tested, and actually put into use. 20 years. So that makes Mark Rahner about 87 by the time this is actually a real thing. If I can hear you in here. You oh, oh, you that, can, right? oh, I'm sorry. Just making sure that you're listening. Okay. Well, this new propulsion, theorized propulsion system, it uses pulses of superheated plasma to generate tremendous levels of thrust and it's currently in phase two of, a, of development and is funded by NASA innovative advanced concepts program. The phase two study is uh, ske- scheduled to begin this month. It is focused on optimizing the engine design, performing proof of concept experiments and designing a PPR powered shield sh- a spaceship for human missions to Mars. And this will probably be something for Elma's children or grandchildren. Not for you and me, Mark. We Well, we, but who doesn't like tremendous levels of thrust, though? Honestly. No, I, no Elmer, don't talk that. No, that's just a double entendre. That's don't not funny. Don't let him intimidate you. <laughs> you don't have to do that. Uh, I, I would say this. Most technology is beyond our years. I think the next major advancement in thrust is probably beyond our lifetimes. We're not going to reach interstellar light speed uh, anytime soon, put no, it that I, way. At your age, you're never going to have an advancement <laughs> in thrust. I no. Promise you that. There we go. Oh, Thank goodness you. gracious. Goodness gracious. It's about time. Yes. Well, they're, they're estimating if everything were to work as theorized, uh, this spacecraft carrying four people or six people could travel roughly 100,000 miles per hour. 
and the PPR rocket would have to slow down significantly to enter orbit. So that's the thing. You know, when you have 100,000 miles an hour in speed, you have to develop some sort of space brake to slow down. Yeah, physics don't work the way you see them in Star Wars. No, not at all. It's not like you can just slow down and brake and hey, hit that curve like they do in Star Wars. You can't have a dog fight. Uh, you, you don't hear stuff. No, you don't hear stuff. You don't hear the lasers and the shooting and explosions. None of that. But, but Star Wars has never really been big on actual science. Oh, well, Star Wars is fantasy. Star Trek is science fiction. Yeah. I, the closest thing I would say to science as far as movies go. 2001. 2001. Interstellar was pretty good. I'm not so sure I agreed with the whole bookcase thing. Yeah, but the, the ending. Uh, I, I, it was I, it was great until they got to the third act. Put it that way. Yeah. Character motivations. None of it made sense. Wait a minute. You're going to leave your daughter that you were trying the whole movie to get back to who's get, who old and getting ready to die to chase after this chick who's on the other side of the galaxy who doesn't even like you, who's obsessed about some other astronaut who died on said rock on the other side of the galaxy. And you can just uh, take a spaceship on a joyride. Just pick one up. Just pick one and just take one from the yeah. hangar and go. And going to leave all the new family members that you never met. In other words, your daughter, her children, her grandchildren, her great-great-grandchildren. They had all of a conversation of four minutes, and he was out chasing some ass. You didn't see Neil Armstrong doing that. Not at all. And he was a real American hero. That's right. Not Matthew McConaughey. Here, here. He's a fake American hero. It's later with Mo Kelly. We'll check in with George Norrie and Coast to Coast AM in just a moment. KFI AM 640. We are live everywhere on the iHeartRadio app. M640. It's later with Mo Kelly. Live everywhere on the iHeartRadio app. Coming up in just a few moments will be Coast to Coast AM with George Nori, who joins me right now on the line. Good evening, sir. What a weekend, Mo, huh? That's Ooh. one way to describe it. It's one thing to experience things in real time, but it's, it's, it's like uh, the world is speeding up in a way which I can't even comprehend. In our lifetime, we have been through so much stuff, haven't we? It seems like history moved at a snail's pace in comparison. Anyway, on the show tonight, after our news of the day, which we will cover the big story, of course, we're going to talk about forbidden archaeology, and then later on, a little walk on the paranormal side on Coast to Coast. All right. I'll be sure to be tuning in on the way home, sir. Thanks, Mo. And before we get out of here, just want to remind you, if there's anything that you missed a part of tonight's show, let's say you want to pick up your horoscope and didn't hear it, or you want to hear my thoughts about the Trump assassination attempt, you didn't hear me, obviously, on Saturday or Sunday, and you're curious what I thought about it, you can check that out on the podcast. It was the full first hour of the show where I laid out where I was, what I thought in the moment, what we've learned since the larger debate about rhetoric and political violence, what path we're on now, what the future may hold. I addressed all of that. I talked about how what may look like as the eventual winner of the presidential race right now. If you look at history, it could go either way. Sometimes we get a little ahead of ourselves. 2016 was a perfect example. 1968 was another example, and I draw those parallels. If you want to check that out, that's all in the podcast that Tawal Sharp, producer of the program, is putting together right now. And as, as I was just talking to George Norrie, talking about the incredible times that we're living in, I'm a student of history. I love history. I love looking at the present through the lens of history, what comparisons can be made what parallels are there what can we learn from previous events which were similar to what we're experiencing right now and even though there are some parallels 1968 is an obvious parallel there's really nothing like the times we're in at this moment and we probably won't have the right words to explain it or the perspective to best understand it for another 20, 30 years. You usually have to go way down the road and look back to best understand what is happening in, in this moment. I'm sure similar words were said in 1968, given the unrest in the country, given the assassinations, the riots, 
the political acrimony. From what I understand, it took a good 20 years or so, well into the 1980s, to best understand how much tumult was going on in 1968. And mind you, that's after the civil rights struggles of the Voting Rights Act, the Civil Rights Act. That's after the Cuban Missile Crisis. I tell you, America was a mess in the 1960s. But, but, you can make an apt comparison to America in the 2020s as far as the amount of dysfunction that we are dealing with on a daily basis, the inability to seemingly get the easy stuff right when it comes to elections or basic getting along. Everything is a congressional inquiry. Everything is a fight on Capitol Hill. Nothing is easy. We we have a, a, a dispute about everything from Christmas to Starbucks to children's entertainment to education. We can't agree on anything. And I'm quite sure people will say it was because of the Democrats. So some people will say because of the Republicans. I'll let you all fight that out. Honestly, I'm tired. I am really, really tired of what America is right now. And I was talking to a younger person who was asking like what I thought about this, because if you're not over the age of 2025, 20, you have no reference point. You have no perspective. What you're going through now is normality. This is what you expect. This is what you know. This is all, you know, you know, what's happening on Capitol Hill. You expect that that gridlock. That's what it is. That's always what it's going to be. And I remember a time it, it wasn't like that in the 1980s. You may have had uh, Ronald Reagan as president, but you also had Tip O'Neill as a Speaker of the House. And somehow, some way, they managed to get things done. They managed to move the country forward. And, and those days seem so long ago. I don't know if we'll ever get back to that. But I was speaking to a young person and trying to tell them that what's happening right now is not always like it used to be. And I don't know if we'll ever get back to that point. I don't know what you think of this moment, Mark. But there are oftentimes where I'm very dissuaded and pessimistic about whether we'll su- su- uh, successfully navigate this moment without decapitate, decapitate, ugh, de- decapitating ourselves in the process. Yeah, I can't say I'm exactly becoming more of an optimist as we go through these things. But uh, you mentioned uh, wanting to keep an eye on history, and I'm totally on the same page as you when it comes to that. And as much of a grotesque cesspool of disinformation that Twitter is, I pay close attention to historian Twitter. Yes. Some historians I follow. Uh, Kevin Cruz isn't on there anymore, but he's terrific, and he's probably not on there because it's turned into such a cesspool. Uh, Timothy Snyder is another good one to follow. But just uh, look at historian Twitter, uh, and they have uh, – it's not opinion. It's uh, – th- these are experts who know history and will tell you what we're going through now what it resembles and you know the degree to which you should be alarmed what people have done in the past it's very instructive to me well let me put it this way and i know you are acting in in a news capacity so i know you choose your words very wisely i don't have to choose them wisely i always say history doesn't necessarily repeat itself but it damn sure rhymes there are some real reminiscent moments rhetoric um occurrences which are happening right now and you only best appreciate that when you have the historical foundation to recognize it if you haven't studied it then you're not going to recognize it it's not going to seem eerily similar unless you know to what it's similar to that's exactly right ruth ben giat is another one too and she's oh uh, yeah she's a good one an expert on uh totalitarianism authoritarian governments and I just, you know, it takes somebody pretty talented to make history come alive for you. And I was lucky enough to have a couple of professors, shout out to old Leroy Ashby here, uh, who really were good at stringing things together and making you understand the significance of, of how A ultimately led to Z. And this is a good time to study that stuff, to read that stuff. And boy, when, when stuff is happening at the uh, intensity and speed that things are happening now, it hardly seems like homework. It seems like you're arming yourself to prepare to understand what we're going through in this moment. Yeah, and it's never about 
today. It's never about what happened today, what happened yesterday. There's a progression. There is a, a series of events which led up to a certain moment it, or a certain politician or a certain occurrence. Like going back to the to the assassination of attempt on President Trump. It wasn't just what happened on Saturday. There was a lot of stuff which led up to it. And I'm not talking about in the conspiracy sense. I'm not talking about in the shooter's life. I'm talking about the totality of society. Uh, you know, the, the violence that we see perpetrated on Saturday is not new. And if we're going to talk about violent rhetoric, it, we have to talk about gun violence in America. We have to talk about all these things which are happening simultaneous to what happened on Saturday. And although we we don't want Saturday to ever happen again, it probably will happen again because we fully embrace violence and violent rhetoric in America. And we don't have that conversation. We're too busy talking about condemning the Democrats for what they said on Tuesday and not talking about what has been said for the past Two years, the past four years, and the things which have happened that you were okay with, but since it didn't happen to your preferred candidate or your preferred party, then it's no big deal. Like I said in the first segment, a lot of folks were laughing at Paul Pelosi getting hit with a hammer. Don't think I forgot. And those same people are saying today, oh, my gosh, we need to tone down the rhetoric. Really? Really? There are a lot of self-appointed hall monitors that I've seen. I've been doing as much reading, watching, listening as I possibly can. And uh, they almost convey that it's impolite to bring up things that we know in the recent past. <laughs> yes. Don't ever let anyone tell you to do that, ever. Because the opposite is true right now. We need to be mindful of what's gone before. And you just can't have an honest discussion about this stuff unless you bring everything into it. Well, but see, the thing is, you're presupposing that people want to have an honest discussion. I don't think so. I think people want to be politically right, small r, in the moment so they can win an argument on Twitter, on social media, not actually getting to the heart of the matter. If you're only worried about political violence since Saturday, I can't take you seriously. No, it's a form of gaslighting, intimidation, bullying. You've got to put it into the big picture. And anybody who tells you now's not a, the good, a good time to talk about X, Y, or Z or politicize X, Y, or Z, uh, those aren't serious people. You shouldn't listen to them. Not at all. But you can listen to us. There we'll, you go. We'll be back tomorrow. Same time. KFI AM 640. We're live everywhere on the iHeartRadio app. Not just stimulating talk. It's more KFI and KOST HD2. Los Angeles, Orange County. Live.